Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You are welcome to yet another economics class. In our last class, we considered market structure. And under the topic, we looked at public market. Inshallah, today, we shall continue our discussion on the topic market structure, where we shall be looking at the second classification under market structure, which is known as imperfect market. As a brief reminder, in our previous discussion on the private uh, market, you were made to understand that a private market is any market situation involving many buyers and sellers of homogeneous products, such that the operators are price takers. That is, on the private market, both the buyers and sellers are described as price takers because none of them can influence the price of the goods and services. We also con considered a number of features or factors or conditions or qualities that define a private market. These qualities included free entry and exit, power mobility of resources, access of prevention treatment, and so on and so forth. Today, we shall look at imperfect market as I've earlier on said. What is an imperfect market? An imperfect market may be defined as any market structure where either the buyers or the sellers can influence the prices of goods and services because they are few in number. That is to say, in an imperfect market, the operators are price setters because they have control over the price of the goods and services which they ought, which they sell. And uh, before we can have an imperfect market, a market is said to be described as an imperfect market if all the characteristics that have been highlighted in the perfect market are missing, or if at least one of those characteristics of a perfect market is what is missing. So we have a market arrangement where there is no perfect information or perfect knowledge about the operation of the market. Such a market is an imperfect market. Or you have a market arrangement whereby the kind of goods and services that are bought and sold are not homogeneous. So if we have a market where heterogeneous products are bought and sold, such a market is an imperfect market. You have a market whereby the operators have control over the price. Such a market is what? Is an imperfect market and so on and so forth. So that is an imperfect uh, market. Then let us now look at the conditions. Conditions necessary for an imperfect market. That before we can accept a market to be described as an imperfect market. Certain conditions are very, very essential. One, there are few buyers and sellers. So before a market can be considered to be an imperfect market, in such a market, there must be either few buyers or few sellers in such a market. Unlike under perfect market, where we have many buyers as well as many sellers. Another condition is that in an imperfect market, the goods sold in the market are heterogeneous. I've said that one earlier on. This also differentiates an imperfect market from a perfect market. In a perfect market, we have homogeneous products. That the type of commodities that are sold and bought in a, par in a perfect market are homogeneous. But in an imperfect market, they deal in heterogeneous products. Products where you can easily identify areas of what differences. Another condition is that in an imperfect market, there is no free entry and exit. As against what we have in the world, in a perfect market, where there is free entry and exit. So the implication of this is that in an imperfect market, new entrants cannot just come in into the world, into the market to operate. Because we have a number of barriers that have been put in place that will just discourage or prevent new operators from joining the world, the market. Another condition is that in an imperfect market we have preferential treatment which is not the case under perfect market we said in the perfect market there is absence of preferential treatment we need that everybody is treated equally but in the case of an imperfect market there is preferential treatment another condition is that there is lack of private information in an imperfect market which is also not the case under perfect market in the perfect market, we say there is a perfect knowledge about the world market operations. So this is not the case in an imperfect market. So to go through the conditions under imperfect market once again, there are few buyers and sellers. 
The goods sold to the market are heterogeneous. There is no free entry and exit. Preferential treatment exists in the market, and there is also, there is also lack of perfect uh, information. Also, as an addition, in an private market, also the operators are price setters because they have control over the price of the goods and services. Next, let's look at types of imperfect market. Yeah, we have different forms of market under imperfect market. We have monopoly, we have monopolistic competition, oligopoly, duopoly, monopsony, oligopsony, duopsony, and so on and so forth. But for the purpose of our class, we shall limit ourselves to monopoly as well as uh, monopolistic competition. But I will only take the pain. I will trust as for you to give you the meanings of the other forms of market which we are not going to discuss in details. So, monopoly to start with. When we talk of monopoly, even though we are seeking to look at it now, monopoly is a form of uh, is an imperfect market that involves a single seller or a single producer of a single commodity that has no close substitute. And as such, the seller is a price setter because you can control the price of what of this commodity. The monopolistic policy competition is another form of power market which involves many buyers and many sellers that sell heterogeneous products. So you have to see where this one differs from power market. In power market, we say there are many buyers and many sellers that sell homogeneous product. But under monopolistic competition, it involves a market where we have many buyers, many sellers, but that sell heterogeneous product. So the products that are sold in monopolistic competition market are differentiated products. They are not what homogeneous. Well, oligopoly is another form of market situation that involves few sellers. So a market situation involving few sellers. He described as an oligopoly. Duopoly. Duo means two. So duopoly is an imperfect market where we have two sellers. Monopsoly is another imperfect market that involves a single buyer. So it's a type of market where we have just what? One buyer of a particular commodity. Oligopsoly is, a, is an imperfect market where we have few buyers. While duopsoly is a part you know, it's an imperfect market that involve two buyers, two buyers. Oligopsoling, few buyers. Monopsoling, one buyer. Duopoly, two sellers. Oligopoly, few sellers. So take note of them. Now, we shall now look at monopoly. Even though I've given you a brief insight into what a monopoly is all about. Mono means one. So monopoly is a it's an imperfect market that involves one seller or one producer of a particular commodity or service that has no close substitute. And as a result of that, a monopolist is described as a price setter because it can influence either the price or quantity. But it cannot influence the two simultaneous. I've said that one earlier on. All the operators who have on the public market are price setters because they have control over the world, over the price of the goods and services which the world they sell. So monopoly will be defined as a market situation where there's only one producer or supplier of a particular good or service that has no substitute. Hence, a monopolist is described as a price setter because it can influence either the price or quantity. But it cannot influence the two simultaneously. Please, you have to take note of this. Monopolist has control over the price as well as quantity, but it cannot take both decisions at the same time. So meaning that whenever he's taking decision on price, decision on that of quantity will be what? Will be abandoned. Or if it is taking decision on quantity, then that of what? That of the price will have to be suspended. So that is a monopoly word. A monopoly market, a market where we have just only one producer or one supplier or one distributor of one commodity. And if you look at that commodity very well, it has no substitute. And because of that, the monopolist has control over the price or quantity of the commodity that what that he sells. So we have a number of examples of a monopoly market in the country. In our subsequent class, we shall look at that. Now, let's look at the cause of uh, monopoly. 
We have a number of factors that usually bring about a monopoly market situation. So we shall consider three of them. We have one, natural cause. We have act of parliament, margin of firms, level of technology, patent law, research and development. These are some of the causes of monopoly. You shall not take them one after the other. The first one is natural cause. Yes, some suppliers assume monopoly power or status as a result of the availability of certain resources in their domain which are not available in other world, other territories. Let's take for instance, let's look at Nigeria as a case study. In Nigeria, there are certain states in Nigeria that are described as Niger World, Niger Delta, Niger Delta State. Because these are states that produce what? Oil in Nigeria. Other states within Nigeria do not have parents of oil in Nigeria. So as such, those Niger Delta states that are blessed with crude oil can assume monopoly power over the production of petroleum products in Nigeria against other states that do not have. So that type of monopoly arises naturally. But there's nothing anybody can work and do about it. These resources are naturally what provided by the Almighty God. So this is also applicable when you go to countries. Nigeria is one of the countries that produce that produce crude oil in the world. We have several other countries in the world that are not endowed with crude oil. So as such Nigeria assumes monopoly power over the production of petroleum products against those other countries that do not have petroleum resources in their countries. So that is natural world, natural cause. And that cause of monopoly is known as act of parliament. There are some monopolies that arise as a sort of special laws that are passed to empower them to be the sole producer, sole distributor of a particular product or service within the country. So such monopolies are described as a state monopolies. Before now, when we used to have NEPA, NEPA happened to be an example of what? A state monopoly. A monopoly that occurred as a sort of special law passed by Act of Parliament making NEPA the sole generator, the sole producer, the sole distributor of power in Nigeria. That is that. Another one, look at JAM for instance. JAM also is another form of uh, monopoly that was set up to be responsible for preparing Students, school start uh, leaving students for admission into our institutions. So, meaning that any student, any Nigerian student that aspires to gain admission to our institution in Nigeria, such a student can only do so through JAM. Even though there are several other venues that some people don't usually follow, at the end of the day, they still have to do what is called JAM regularization before the admission can become valid. So, that also is another form of a state monopoly. So JAM also derives its power through out of all parliament, a special law that was passed to make it to be the sole agency that is responsible what is going to gain admission into an institution. That is a lot of margin of firms. Yes, what do you mean by major? Major simply means the coming together of two or more independent firms for the purpose of becoming one larger firm. That is major. So monopoly can also occur when two or more independent firms decide to come together, decide to match their operations, combine their operations together and be carrying out the operation as an entity. By so doing, that will put them in a better position to be able to influence the operation of the market. For this instance, if two or more firms decide to put their operations together, this will enable them to operate on a larger scale. 
There are raw materials that they use for production, they can now buy the world in, on a larger scale, thereby enjoying benefit of what? Economies of scale. Meaning that their cost of production will be, you know, they will be able to beat down their cost of production because if, you, if they are able to buy their input in bulk, they pay less. And once they are able to produce, use their cost of production, that will surely put them in a better position to sell their product at a cheaper rate, which other competitors may not be able to afford. And by so doing, the other operators can be frustrated out of the market, thereby leaving the matched firms to remain the only one in the market. So when two or more independent firms come together, they can assume monopoly power, power through their new status, which now put them in a better position to scare to, uh, you know, to force other smaller competitors out of the world, out of the operation, thereby leaving them alone in the world, in the market. Another cause of monopoly is level of technology. Yes, technology also plays a major role at making a firm to assume monopoly power. We have several firms that are operating in the same line of business. But if a particular one is not able to discover the most efficient method of what? Technology. Maybe others have been using labor intensive method of production. And this one has just come up and introduced capital intensive method of production, which involves the use of machines. And this new method that has been adopted now enables the firm to reduce its cost of production to expand its output. Definitely, this will put it in a better position to sell is product at a cheaper rate, which other competitors may not be able to do, and by so doing, forcing them out of the world, out of the market. So through improved technology, monopoly status can also be can also be assumed by an operator. So that's yet another cause. Another one is patent law. Yeah, this is yet another special law that is usually used to protect the inventions of an inventor. Maybe writers, playwriters. So the essence of patent law is to protect the inventions of inventors. And the essence of this one is that this law makes an inventor to be the alpha and omega of his invention for a simulated period of time, basically 20 years. So someone that has just developed new thing, that has used what is intellectual, is intelligent to come up with what, with new thing that is beneficial to the society, maybe books or anything. Once you're able to have that, the law will make you the alpha and omega, the sole owner of that particular invention for that period of time. So meaning that no other person can tamper or make use of that your invention without your word, proud written permission by you. And that's why if you see most of the textbooks that we use, you see this C. This letter C. We stand for all copyright. Another new we have word. No power or no portion of this book shall be reproduced or uh, written in any form without the prior word, authorization of the word of the owner. That is a patent law. So meaning that for that period of 20 years, the inventor remains the owner, the sole producer and the sole owner of that particular word, invention. So that's another cause. Another one is research and development. Yes, definitely you know, anybody that carries out your research, when research is conducted, new things are discovered. New knowledge is what is discovered. So through research and development, a firm that engages in research and development can be able to discover better and improved method of what? Of doing things. Which at the end of the day will afford him to reduce his cost of production, expand his output, and also sell at a cheaper, world, cheaper rate, thereby frustrating others out of the world, out of the market. So through research and development, new and improved, efficient way of doing what? Of doing things 
is discovered. And the essence of it is that when new things are discovered, it will put you at a position to reduce your cost of production. And you know, once you're able to reduce your cost of production, you, are, you will be in a better position to sell your products at a cheaper rate, which your competitors may not be able to do. So these are some of the causes of monopoly. Natural cause, act of parliament, margin of fence, level of technology, patent law, as well as research and uh, development. Now let's look at how to control monopoly. Yes, we have a number of ways through which monopoly power can be controlled. These are some of them through privatization, reduction of tariffs, price legislation, discouraging merger, provision of substitute goods, and so on and so forth. Privatization. What is privatization? Privatization is one of government uh, policies which involves the transfer of government owned business enterprises. Into private individuals. So the transfer of government owned, the transfer of government what transfer of a government owned enterprises to private individuals is known as a privatization. So the transfer of the ownership and control management of enterprises that are entered to owned by the government into the hands of private individuals is what is known as a privatization. Yeah. Through privatization, monopoly power can be controlled. Like the issue of uh, NEPA I told you of. Before, when we used to have NEPA, you were agree with me that the services even rendered by NEPA then was not efficient. People were being made to pay for services they never enjoyed. And if you refuse to pay your bills, they come and you know, come around, disconnect your life, even cut away your what, your cables. Because then we had no alternative. NEPA was the only agency, the only what, only producer and generator and supplier of what, of electricity in Nigeria at that time. To see how powerful NEPA was then, even the then former governor of Lagos State. Um, Senator Bola Metinubu, while he was the governor of Lagos State, he went to Germany to go and fight a power uh, um, expert from Germany to come and generate and supply power to the people of Lagos State. The company was brought, you know, uh, brought down to Lagos, but eventually the company could not, work, could not operate as a result of the law that established NEPA. Preventing it from having any form of a compare competitor. But when NEPA was privatized, they can now see new things coming into the world, into the sector. Efficiency is enhanced. To start an extent, consumers are getting value for their work, for their money. So through privatization, monopoly power can be what? Can be broken. Monopoly power can be broken. Monopoly can be what? Can be controlled. So that is privatization. And that power can only be what? Can only be curtailed by transferring the ownership and control of government owned enterprises to private individuals. So that is that. We have private sector now in what? In power sector in Nigeria. Look at uh, NITEL, Nigeria Telecommunication. In those days, when it used to be the world, the sole operator in, in, you know, in charge of uh, telecommunication services in Nigeria. The service then was not efficient. Consumer did not get value for their work with their money at that time. Larger part of Nigerians could not even have access to work to telecom services. But when it was privatized, private enterprises came in. We had the likes of MTN and Globalcom. We have self, you know, uh, so many of them. I cannot see since it's privatization. Efficiency has come in. A lot of people now enjoy the services and they get value for their work, for their money. So that is the power of privatization. Another way of controlling monopoly is through reduction of tariffs. What are tariffs? Tariffs are taxes that are levied on imported and exported commodities. That is tariffs. And that's why we have two forms of tariffs. We have import tariff, we have export tariff. 
So taxes that are imposed on imported and exported commodities are described as uh, tariffs. So through reduction of tariffs, government can also control monopoly power by reducing tariffs that are imposed on goods and services that are imported from other countries that serve as close substitute to the one provided by monopolies within the country. If that is done, more importers will be encouraged to bring more of such substitute goods into the country, thereby limiting and reducing or controlling the power of monopolies within the world, within the country. Another one, another control is price legislation, which basically means price control. Through effective price control, monopoly power can also be controlled. In the era of NEPA, like I said earlier on, NEPA used to charge people exorbitantly. You might not even have uh, power more than twice in the month. You can just bring anywhere, any amount, any bills to you which you must pay. They charge exorbitantly. They charge just anyhow. They charge discriminate, you know, they discriminate even in their work, in their in their charges. You have houses, you have a you know two-story building where they may they might be asked to just pay two thousand naira in a month. Then you can have a what? A a a a, a bungalow. As you have to pay seven thousand, ten thousand in a month. They charge just anyhow because there was no any level of uh, control as regards how they must charge. So through price legislation, government can also come up with price legislation, stipulating amounts that could be charged by monopolies for certain commodities. And by so doing, it will help in checkmating their excesses. Under control is discouraging merger. Yeah. Governments will also, through discouragement of merger, monopoly can also be well controlled. That monopoly that arises through merger can be controlled by discouraging merger. Don't forget I told you, merger involves the coming together of two or more independent firms to become an entity. And we said when such occurs, this new entity becomes more powerful such that they have a level of control. They are in a better position to influence and frustrate other competitors out of the world, out of the market, thereby leaving them only in the world, in the market. So in order to safeguard that, margin of firm should also be discouraged. So another control is through provision of solitary goods. Yeah. By making available goods that will serve as substitutes to the ones provided and supplied by monopolies. This will also go a long way at controlling and even breaking monopoly power. So once again, these are some of the ways of controlling monopoly power. Privatization, reduction of tariffs, price legislation, discouraging merger, and provision of uh, substitute uh, goods. Next. Let's look at the uh, equilibrium of the monopolies. One thing must be known that looking at the position that the monopolist is, he is in a better position to maximize profit, even both in the short run and all, and the long run, because he is the only one. And looking at the kind of goods or service that he renders, we say it has no word, substitute, and it's a commodity for that matter without substitute. And it's a price setter. It determines the price at which you want. It sells. So by so doing, it's in a better position to maximize profit, to make excess profit, both in the short run and in the long run. So equilibrium of the monopoly usually occurs where price is greater than marginal cost. And where marginal cost is called marginal revenue. I told you when we started our discussion, in our last uh, discussion, that when, we, when it's come to profit maximization, the golden rule for profit maximization under market structure is where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So profit is maximized where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. The same thing is the case under monopoly market. So unlike in a perfect market, the monopoly does not attain equilibrium by equating price of the commodity to marginal cost. There no power market, no other power market we have what share. The power committee has a power elastic word, demand curve, such that demand is equal to work, revenue is equal to work, marginal work, marginal revenue. But in the case of monopoly market, the price 
is not equal to what to its uh, uh, marginal revenue. In fact, the marginal revenue of a monopoly is halfway of the you know, the origin, as in the, the price axis, and that of the average world revenue. So we shall look at that uh, graphically. Look at that graphically. Yeah, this is the equilibrium uh, of the monopolies. Look at the demand curve. Look at the market demand curve. This one is a downward sloping world demand curve, unlike under perfect market where we have what? Perfect elastic demand curve. And the reason for that is that under perfect market, the operators are price setters. It is assumed that neither the buyers and the sellers can influence the price. And I told you then also that the price is just determined through the force of demand and supply under perfect market. But under monopoly market, we said the operators are price what? They are price setters. Meaning that they have level of control over the price. And because they are price setters, that is why they have a downward sloping market demand curve, as you can see. And why is it downward sloping? They have control over the price. They can inflate what? Inflate the price as they, as they, as they wish. But they cannot compel the consumers as in buyers to buy certain level of output. So as they have control over the price, consumers also have they are at liberty to also determine, determine the level of quality they are to what? They are to buy. And that is why when they increase what? Their price, for instance, it is expected that consumers also have the option of what? Of reducing the quantity they what? They buy. Even though they cannot just shy away from the commodity, you know, completely because it's an essential commodity. So as the monopolies increase the price in order to maximize what? Profit. Consumers also have the right, they have their own power of limiting the world, limiting the quantity they buy. Don't forget the law of what? Of demand. They are the price, set the price, the price, the lower the quantity demanded. So that is why we are having a downward sloping demand curve under monopoly world, monopoly market. So we have uh, the demand curve, the demand curve, downward sloping, which is called what? Average growth, average revenue curve, as you can see. Then we have our average growth, average cost curve, AC, which is used as usual. And I told you, having gotten your average growth, average cost curve, every rational producer usually produces at the lowest possible cost. Because you can only maximize profit by minimizing cost. So a rational producer usually minimizes cost so as to maximize what? So as to maximize profit. And that is why when you want to now plot your work, your marginal cost. I've always told you the marginal cost curve must pass through the minimum level of the average cost. The marginal cost must pass through the world, minimum point of what? Average cost. Indicating that the producer has produced at the lowest possible cost. So that is what you know that, that is what we have. This is the, uh, the marginal cost. You can see. You can look at the slope, it passes through the world, the minimum level of what? Of the average average cost. This are what? This are our our average cost. So after identify all this, the next one is to indicate the what? The marginal revenue. I've told you the marginal revenue is not equal to what? To the demand curve, as in the case of power world, power market. Instead, the marginal revenue curve is halfway, is the midpoint of uh, the origin. And what? The average revenue curve, as you can see, it is up. So that is what we have here. This is the marginal revenue curve. No, this is the marginal revenue curve. This is it here. This is the marginal revenue curve, as you can see. That is the marginal revenue curve. So after now identified all this, the next thing is for us to now uh, bring in our golden rule of profit maximization. Profit is maximized where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So looking at our curve here, well, this is the marginal revenue curve, as you can see. This is the marginal revenue curve, and then this what? This is the marginal what? The marginal cost curve. This is the marginal cost. This is the marginal cost curve. You can see it. So where this marginal cost curve and marginal revenue curve meet, this is the point where they meet. They meet as what? At point A. That is the point where marginal revenue curve intersects the marginal cost curve. So that point where they meet, you trace it down, trace it upward, trace it upward to the Demand curve, we have point B. Then from there, trace it down to, uh, to the price axis, giving us P1. So indicating that 
OP1 is the price per unit. OP1. That is the price per unit. And I've told you earlier on that price per unit is something as well, average revenue. So which means OP1 is the what? Average revenue of the monopolies. Then also from that point where MC calls M out, trace it downward to the uh, output level, we have Q1. So meaning that OQ1 is the word output. It is the uh, profit maximizing output. That is the total quantity being sold by the monopolies to maximize the profit. OQ1. To now have uh, the total revenue as you are. Total revenue is equal to what? After revenue multiplied by total quantity sold. And after revenue is what? OP1. This is after revenue from here. OP1. They multiply by total output, which is what? O Q1. When you multiply this line by the breadth, we give you the word, the entire rectangle, which is uh, O P1 B Q1. That is total revenue. O P1 B Q1. That is total revenue. So we have known our total revenue. The next thing is to determine our total cost. Don't forget, you cannot establish the profit. If you don't have your total revenue in place, and if you don't know what, you don't have your total cost in place. So we've identified our total revenue. The next thing is to determine our total cost. How do you get that total cost? Look at that line where MC cost M out. You know, MC is got M out at this point. You now trace that line to meet the average cost curve. Where it meets with average cost curve. Don't forget this word. This is average cost curve. Average cost. This is average cost. Can see that is our average cost curve. It goes like that. That is average cost curve. So and our M has got to MC at this word at this point. So tracing this point to meet that average cost curve. So we have it as what at point C. So that point C trace it back to what to the price axis to have D. So meaning that O D is the average cost. O D is what average cost. So we have known our average cost. Total quantity produced as you is what? O Q1. So with the two variables you know, in play, we can know our total cost. Our total cost will now be what? Average cost multiplied by total quantity produced. And our average cost is what? OD, then multiply by our total output is what? O Q1. So it's like multiplying this line by what? By this spread. We have the entire shape, which is what? This shape. O D C Q1. That is total cost. O D C Q1. That's our what? Our total cost. The entire shape O P1 B Q1 is total revenue. While our total cost is what? O D C Q1. Then we can now determine our what? Our profit. Profit is equal to total revenue minus total what? Total cost. Our total revenue is the entire shape. O P1 B Q1. Then our total cost is what? O D C Q1. When you remove this shape, total cost, ODCQ1 from the entire shape, you'll be left with the upper word, the upper side, upper shape, which is what? DP1AC. Again, DP1BC. That is our word. That is our revenue. We call that one SS profit. That is shaded word, the shaded region that you are seeing. That is what? The SS profit of the mono monopolies as a profit of the monopolies so this is just the uh the uh explanation of um what i discussed with you on that word in that uh, diagram for the diagram above it could be seen that the profit maximizing output is ok one after revenue ar is op1 total revenue is equal to after revenue multiplied by q which is what the total output which is ok one so that would be because what? Our average revenue is what? OP1 multiplied by total output, OQ1. That gives us that shape, that entire rectangle, you know, that shape, which is what? OP1, BQ1. Then our total cost is to what? AC multiplied by Q. That is equal to what? Our AC is what? OD multiplied by OQ1. Giving us ODCQ1. Profit is equal to total revenue minus total cost. Our total revenue is equal to what? OP1, BQ1. Minus total cost OD CQ1, and when that is you know removed, we have DP1 BC. 
that is the shaded portion. That is a, which is our total what? The SS profit of the monopolies. Don't forget, I told you that monopolies is the position to maximize profit, both in the short run and in the long run, because of the conditions that favor what? That favor, that favor it. So, this uh, will bring us to the end of our discussion. Inshallah, your assignment on this very topic will also be made available in your portal. I will encourage you to go through the assignment, attempt it, submit it, so that I can be able to go through it and uh, uh, assess you appropriately. I pray to Allah Almighty to put Baraka in this that uh, we have done. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.